welcome to Attic Raiders Retro Reviews, where today we're going to be taking on vicious velociraptors, deadly dilophosaurs, and a terrifying T Rex as we take a look at Jurassic Park. <laughs> Jurassic Park was released by Parker Brothers in 1993 in order to coincide with the theatrical release of the smash hit movie Jurassic Park the same year. This is a 2-4 player game for ages 8 and up where players have to race across Isla Nublar, the island home of Jurassic Park, in order to try to be the first to reach the safety of the visitor centre. Unfortunately, the electric fences are down, the dinosaurs have escaped and they are hungry. The first thing to notice about this is the absolutely gorgeous box art, which is one of my all-time favourites. This was painted by artist James Talbot, who's created quite a few game illustrations throughout his career, particularly for Avalon Hill and the Tunnels and Trolls RPG, and appears to be based on a piece of pre-production art drawn by Mark Crash McCreary while working on the movie with Stan Winston Studios. Of course, although this beautiful cover design is really atmospheric and I absolutely love the use of lighting in this, it doesn't really tell us anything about the game inside, other than the fact that it's got an extra large game board, and trust me, it's really big, and that it contains 16 dinosaur figures, in this case a really worthy selling point. Thankfully, however, the back of the box gives a really clear picture of what we can expect to find inside and really shows off those dino miniatures nicely. Now, I'm a big fan of the Jurassic Park franchise, so I've been looking forward to this one for quite a while. As a 10-year-old kid seeing this film in the cinema, it really did thrill me. So can this game live up to the second half of its own tagline and provide chills? Well, let's take a closer look and find out. The game comes with a six-sided die which has got three different dinosaur symbols on it. There's two T-Rex symbols, two Velociraptor symbols and two Dilophosaurus symbols. We've got eight different colours of visitor pass cards representing the main cast of the movie. We've got John Hammond, Lex Murphy, Tim Murphy, Dennis Nedry, Dr Ian Malcolm, Dr Alan Grant, Dr Sattler and Robert Muldoon. Each of these visitor cards goes with a standee of that particular character. Now these are just basic plastic stands with a little cardboard standee on them, so they're not particularly fantastic. Unfortunately, my Robert Muldoon one has been eaten by raptors. Now these cards are okay, the printing on them is quite nice, the backs of them are particularly good, I do like this because it matches the props in the movie, but they're not the thickest, the best quality card, and to be honest, there is absolutely no point in these cards whatsoever. They don't come into the game at all, you just take them and place them in front of you to show you who you are supposed to be in the game, but they don't actually come into the game at all, they're not used, so they are a bit pointless. Now we've got eight different characters here, but this is only a two to four player game. So you're only actually going to use maximum of four of these. And again, it doesn't really actually matter who you are in this game. There is no benefit to being one character over the other. They don't actually have any special abilities which add to the gameplay. So it's more just about choosing your favorite character and hoping that you don't wind up with Nedry. We've got 46 game cards a cardboard net which goes together to build up the three-dimensional visitor center, and the star attraction 16 dinosaur figures. There are six Dilophosaurus or spitters, and as you can see, the detail on these is really, really good. We've got nine Velociraptors or Raptors, and again, the detail has really been picked up in the cast. And we've got one Tyrannosaurus or T-Rex. Again, this is a really, really nice looking piece. The board itself is this nice, thick, slightly glossy cardboard with two fold lines in it, so that when you actually open it up, it is absolutely huge. I'm actually finding it quite difficult to get the whole thing into frame here so that you can see it because it's that big. As you can see, the actual game board, once it's opened up, is massive. If I actually tried to put it in portrait orientation like it's been designed, then it hardly fits on the screen here. As you can see, the board shows Isla Nublar, the actual island where Jurassic Park is based. 
And as far as topography goes, it's pretty spot on to what we actually see in the movie. If we actually compare it to the map that was seen on the prop leaflet that is featured in the movie, then it's basically the same. The actual island shape is exactly as it should be, though obviously it's been stretched out in order to fit this longer board. The topography is also exactly the same. The mountain ridges, the rivers and the lakes are all where they feature on the actual movie map. There are obvious differences between the game board and the real map though. The yellow road here is obviously completely different. The visitor centre up here on the board should actually be further down here. This helipad here should actually be over towards the middle of the island. Instead of having the T-Rex paddock down here right at the south of the island, it should actually be over here on the east. Instead of three Velociraptor paddocks, there should be only one, and that should be located over here. And for the Dilophosaurus, there shouldn't be three paddocks, there should only be one, and that should be over here by the T-Rex. But obviously for gameplay, all of these locations had to be altered. To set up the game, the cardboard visitor centre is first folded and slotted into the slots in the board, and then the roof is carefully pushed in, watching not to rip it, and pushed on in order to give a nice 3D structure. The Velociraptors are placed into their three pens on the island, three raptors in each one. The spitters are then placed into their three pens, but you're only going to get two spitters in each pen, even though each pen takes up three hexes. The T-Rex goes on to his starting space at the south end of the island, and players decide which characters they want to play as, placing their visitor pass cards in front of them and their player standees on the start space. The cards are shuffled and four are dealt to each player and then the rest of the cards are placed at the side of the board where everyone can reach them. The object of the game then is to try to be the first player to get your playing piece from the south of the island all the way across the land to the safety of the visitor centre here in the north avoiding the dinosaurs when they escape. When it's your turn, there are two steps to take. The first is to take the dino die and to roll it to see what kind of dinosaur you're going to have to move. So in this case, I'm going to be moving the Velociraptor and I can move it up to four spaces. Now I could take any of the raptors from any of the pens to move and I can move them across the hexes however I want, except for the maintenance shed which dinosaurs are not allowed to enter. So with a roll of a four, I might move mine one, two, three, four, because we haven't spread out yet, so I don't really want to attack other people when they're on the same space as me. The second step is then to move my pawn. Now, I could either move my pawn one space in any direction, or I could use one of the four cards in my hand in order to try to move further. There are four different types of cards that you might have in your hand. The pack consists of 12 cards which will allow you to move two spaces, 12 cards which will allow you to move two or three spaces if you're on a road, 12 cards which will allow you to escape if you've got a dinosaur on your space, and 10 cards which will allow you to cancel a card that's been played by another player. Now you might think it's a bit of a no-brainer, why would you only move one space when you could use a card to move two or three if you're on a road? Well the reason for that is if you play a card, another player could immediately play one of their cancel cards in order to stop you from doing that movement. And then you're not going to be able to move at all, unless you also have a cancel card and cancel their cancel. Once you've decided how you're going to move, in this case I'm going to use the move two spaces card from my hand and play that into a discard pile, I'm going to move my pawn two hexes. I can then take another card from the pile and draw my hand back up to four cards. If at any time I don't want to move, I can just pass or I can take that opportunity in order to trade in cards. So I can trade in up to four of my cards from my hand, putting them in the discard pile and taking two new ones. As you move around in the game, you cannot move through a space that a dinosaur is in, but you could choose to move into it. You can, however, move through a space that an opponent is in and you could also stop in the same space as them. You can obviously move across or along roads, particularly if you have a road card which is going to help you move further but you can't at any point cross over an electric fence into a dinosaur paddock, even if it's completely empty of dinosaurs. 
In order to avoid the dinosaurs as you move around, you can use the maintenance shed spaces for safety because the dinosaurs are not allowed on these spaces. And then as a bonus, if you end your move on the maintenance shed space, then you can trade in up to four of your cards automatically. Now, when you're rolling and moving dinosaurs, once a dinosaur has moved across an electric fence out of its paddock, it can never go back into one. Dinosaurs can move across roads, they can move across spaces which have other dinosaurs in them and across spaces which have ponds in them. A dinosaur cannot, however, ever stop in the same space as another dinosaur. With the dinosaurs, you want to use them in order to block off paths so that your opponents can't get past them. But if you can do it with the roll that you got, you also want to try to get your dinosaur to land on an opponent's square. If a dinosaur ends its move on your space, then you are going to be in trouble because you're going to be stuck there. The only way that you can get off of this space is by either rolling the symbol that matches the dinosaur that's on your space so that you can then just move it off of you and then carry on your move or you can use an escape a dinosaur card if you have one in your hand if you don't and you don't roll a dinosaur then you're gonna have to stay there you can either hope that you roll the kind of symbol you need on your next go so that you can move that dinosaur off of you, or you can trade in some of your cards in order to try and get an escape a dinosaur card, which you can use on your next go. Either way, you're going to be left there while other players press on towards the safety of the visitor center. Sometimes you might find yourself completely hemmed in and cut off by dinosaurs. Now, if that's the case, although you can't move across a space with the dinosaur, you can end your turn in that same space. It just means that you're choosing to put yourself under attack and potentially be stuck there. But if you have an escape a dinosaur card, then that's not going to be too much of a problem. Unless somebody else can cancel it. Eventually, having travelled the entire length of the island evading dinosaurs, the first person to successfully make it to the safety of the visitor centre and land on the building is going to be the winner. As far as rules go, this is pretty straightforward. There's not too many of them and they're not that complex. As far as production values go, it's a bit of a mixed bag. I find with many TV and movie themed board games, they tend to be rush jobs and very cardboard heavy. They tend to have a lot of cardboard three-dimensional pieces to them and cardboard standees and this game does suffer from that. However, it does also have those 3D plastic dinosaur miniature figures and that is the big selling point for this game because they are absolutely fantastic and really up-level the game. If it was me, I would like to see a bit more plastic pieces in here. The visitor center, if that was plastic instead of cardboard that might rip or bend or break, then that would be a bonus for me. And I'd also like to see the electric fences being represented in three dimensions rather than just flat on the board because then it would help to demark where those pens are and it would just look a lot better. As far as the visitor center goes, I think having it in that northwest corner is not really the best place for it. It's not where it should be on the actual movie prop map, so why they put it there, I'm not quite sure. I can see that obviously they wanted to make the game longer by having to trek all the way from the south to the north of the island, but I think if you moved it over from the west into a more central location at the top of the island, it would give players a lot more freedom and range to use the whole board in order to move across because as far as I've seen in different plays of this game most players just head straight for that west coast and move straight up the coast completely ignoring most of the island. Narratively though as far as the game goes and the movie it doesn't really tie up. I'm not quite sure why the players are running away to try to get to the visitor center. It doesn't particularly make sense because the visitor center is not really a safe place to try to get to. Anyone who's seen the movie will know that the dinosaurs can easily get in and that people get attacked in there. And it's exactly the same with the maintenance sheds. In this game, the maintenance sheds are safe spaces that the dinosaurs aren't allowed in. But once again, anyone having seen the movie will know that the maintenance sheds are far from safe. We've already got 
port and a heliport on the island, so I'm not quite sure why those aren't the destinations that players are heading for. The heliport has already been moved on the board from where it should be officially, so why not just move that somewhere into the north of the island? Because that would make a lot more narrative sense in order to get off of the island and to safety instead of just to the visitor centre. As far as gameplay goes, you're going to find that this is not the most interesting. There's a lot of, well, it's not really a roll and move because you don't have to roll for your own playing pieces. You do have to roll for the dinosaurs, but your own playing pieces you're determining by the move of the cards or just going a single move. But you're going to find that as you move, you get stopped a lot by the dinosaurs. Now, that's obviously the point of the game. The dinosaurs are meant to block your way and the dinosaurs are meant to land on your space in order to stop you. But it happens a lot in this game, so much so that it gets quite tedious after a while. And again, talking narratively and thematically, it's pretty odd that in this game, none of the dinosaurs actually eat you. You get attacked by them, but they just stop you from moving. And considering that there's actually eight playing pieces that have been provided, I think there's definitely scope for that to happen. The tedium can be exacerbated a little bit when you're trying to get off of a space with a dinosaur. Again, you're just waiting around there, but you can play your dinosaur escape card. But if another player plays a cancel card, that's it. Unless you play a cancel card, but then somebody else can also play a cancel card and you can keep going until there are no cancel cards left. And admittedly, that can be quite amusing if frustrating. Given the popularity of Jurassic Park, particularly with Jurassic World coming out at the cinemas these days, this board game can command quite a high price. Is it worth that price? Well, it depends whether you want to have it as a piece of Jurassic Park memorabilia or whether you want to have it as a board game. As a piece of memorabilia, it's fantastic. It's great, definitely go for it. But as far as an actual game goes, well, there's better ones out there. So overall, is it a recommendation? Well, if you're a Jurassic Park fan, yes, definitely. If you're not, mm, this one's probably worth a miss and I would go for the Jurassic Park 2 board game instead. I'm going to be reviewing that shortly and the Jurassic Park 3 board game, so keep a lookout for that. If you liked what you've seen, please consider commenting, liking and subscribing. And we'll see you next time on Attic Raiders Retro Reviews.